Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Monday, September 18th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hope you guys had a great weekend. Seems to be a lot going on right now. The president is at the UN speaking about the crisis with North Korea, the situation with Iran, um, things going on around Israel, all kinds of things. I think we're going to hear a lot that comes out of this UN meeting. We're seeing a lot of pushback against the UN. Um, people in our government saying, you know what, it's about time we stopped giving money to the UN. You know, they're really not doing anything. Let's redirect that money somewhere else. Maybe even sell that land that the UN is on and have them go somewhere else. It's like, wow, that's, that's quite a departure from the norm. But a lot of things going on right now. So let's, let's have a look at a few of them. Out of Israel today, I mean, this headline pretty much says it all. Iran reiterates threat to destroy Israel in very near future. Iran seeking to destroy Israel. We know from Ezekiel 38 and Ezekiel 39 in Holy Scripture that Persia, which is modern-day Iran, leads a world army against Israel. We also know the outcome of that hopeless plan. Um, but Iran reiterates threat to destroy Israel in very near future. A top Iranian general this week again threatened to destroy Israel, saying the Jewish state's demise would come even sooner if it didn't keep quiet about the nuclear deal Tehran signed with Barack Obama. You know, three weeks ago, this same man said that within 25 years, Israel would no longer exist. He said that doesn't mean Israel will have the full 25 years to live, though. Huh. Threatening Iran's or Israel's complete demise. This is what the godless want to do against God's chosen. I think that's a big part of it. People know that the Israelites are God's chosen. And a lot of people don't like that. They hate Israel because of that. Oh, God singled them out. You know why they're God's chosen, right? I mean, God chose the Jewish race to bring us the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. You can read in Matthew 1, starting in verse 1, the genealogy from Abraham down the line to King David, down the line further to Jesus himself. That's why they're chosen. That's a pretty high honor. But those who don't know God, the true God, the real God, the one and only God, they'll do everything they can to try to destroy God's chosen people. Um, out of United with Israel, there's a Hamas cleric that says the Quran requires extermination of Jews and the destruction of Israel. A Hamas cleric declared that the destruction of Israel and the Jewish people will bring blessing to the world. You know, President Barack Obama once famously said, you know, people have been drawn to Islam's message of peace. And the very word itself, Islam, comes from salam, which means peace. Adding that the overwhelming majority of the world's Muslims embrace Islam as a source of peace. Just another lie from those that follow a liar. Um... But this Hamas cleric, Musin Abu Ita, he says the Meccan parts of the Quran, you know, if, if you study the Quran, I've read the Quran, uh, it kind of progresses from Mecca to Medina uh, and later parts. But he says the Meccan parts of the Quran have a very unpeaceful attitude toward Jews and even toward the modern state of Israel, both of whom, he claims, are preventing the world from enjoying the blessings of the future worldwide caliphate. He says the Quran requires the extermination of Jews and the destruction of Israel. And these are the very same kinds of people the world is trying to force Israel to make 
peace with, to give up their land to. You think if they gave up land that there would be peace in the land they gave up? I mean, it works so well with the Sinai and with Gaza, right? <laughs> no. Um, out of the Times of Israel, Mossad chief said to be pushing to act now to prevent Iran from having a nuclear bomb. How do you act now? Well, maybe you take out their nuclear facilities. And probably in doing so would cause Iran to respond with Russia and a world army to come against Israel, like Ezekiel 38-39 speaks of. I think people were watching things developing that will be Bible prophecies unfolding before us. Out of world Israel news, Trump sees a good chance for Israeli-Palestinian peace deal. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu is thankful for Trump's support for Israel. Um, Donald Trump expressed optimism. Still trying to get probably the greatest peace deal of all time into place. I guess we'll wait and see. Kind of a watch and see what happens kind of attitude. How about this? Out of world Israel news. America opens its first military base on Israeli soil. See, I thought America already had a base, but maybe they just kind of shared one. I, I don't know. But America is opening the first military base in Israel? Wow, that's, that's pretty big. I think the world is seeing who's siding up with who. It's a message that says Israel is better prepared, said the IDF's aerial defense commander on the opening of the first U.S. military base on Israeli soil. All right. This base is going to be, uh, let's see. It's talking that Israel is much better prepared. Israel is improving the response to threats. Uh, this base will operate under Israeli military directives. Hmm, very interesting. The times they are a-changing. <laughs> How about this sick little headline? Out of the Clarion Project, ISIS encourages attacks on U.S. hurricane relief centers. If anyone still believes that Islam is the religion of peace, when they are told from their book to kill Jews, to destroy Israel, to kill those who don't believe the lies that they believe, to attack places that are trying to help people. ISIS encourages attacks on U.S. hurricane relief centers. ISIS is, is encouraging its members to attack Hurricane Harvey relief centers in Houston. A social media post by the terror group and also posted in Newsweek says, to all the lone mujahids in the U.S., pop down to Houston and drop in at any relief centers housing displaced people from the Houston floods. Make sure to bring lots of supplies, gadgets, and toys to see if you can help put any unbeliever out of their misery. Hmm. Go kill those who are trying to help others. Yeah, that's a message of peace, don't you think? I heard this story of this lady named Carrie um, Decline. She, she was diagnosed with brain cancer back in April. She was pregnant. Um, but the chemotherapy would have ended the life of her unborn child. So this woman, Carrie, chose to give birth to her daughter without chemotherapy. She didn't have any of, any of the medication that could have saved her life because it would have killed her daughters. So this mother died so her daughter could live. Um, the mother died three days after giving birth. She died at the age of 37. Hmm. There was a reporter that asked the dad, the husband, how he would explain his wife's death to his daughter one day. And the husband was grieving, was obviously in, in sorrow and pain. He said, I'll tell her that mommy did this because she loves you and she is in heaven and we'll see her again soon. That little girl should never live a day without doubting her mother's love for her. 
She gave her life for her. You know, we can completely relate to this because we're in the exact same position. Our father sent his son to die on a cross so we could live. Jesus paid our debt. He purchased our salvation with his blood. He's forgiven every sin we've ever confessed to him, according to 1 John 1, verse 9. He's removed our sin as far as the east is from the west, Psalm 103, verse 12. He buried it in the depths of the deepest sea, Micah 7, verse 19. And he remembers our sin no more, Isaiah 43, verse 25. See, a lot of people, I think, though, don't see sin the same way God does. Um, I, like, I like the works of a pastor named, um, oh, Charles Spurgeon. And I, I've read most of his sermons. I've, I've seen many of the things he said. Very intelligent man. This was back in the, what, 19th century? Uh, a couple of hundred years ago or so. Um, but he told his congregation at the time, guilt is a tool that the devil uses against good people. You know, the more we acknowledge our sin and the need for repentance, then the guiltier we're made to feel about it. You know, after we've confessed our sin, after we've been forgiven, sometimes we still suffer from guilt. You know, how many times have you asked for forgiveness for the same sin? You know, several times because you still felt guilty about it. I've done that, guilty. Um, but we need to use our sin as a tool for sanctification. You know, when we confess our failures and our sins and our shortcomings and we receive God's forgiveness, then we can see and understand the depth of God's love for us. We can remember with gratitude the suffering that Jesus endured for our salvation. The beatings, the whipping, the scourging, um, the nails driven through his hand, his feet, the crown of thorns on his head. We can ask the Holy Spirit to empower us so we don't fall into that same temptation. Um, Charles Spurgeon said that there were three R's that contain the, the sum and substance of God's word. The three R's that Charles Spurgeon spoke of was ruin, redemption, and regeneration. See, after we confess our ruin and we claim God's redemption, we're not finished until we move to regeneration. You know, kind of like our spiritual broken bones can mend and become even stronger than before. Um, the sins that separate us from God the Father can become the bridge that draws us even closer to God the Father. And then at that point, I think sometimes our, our scars, our experience becomes useful as we seek to serve others, serve God, serve others. You know, King David wrote Psalm 51, this, this psalm, this hymn of confession and restoration, but he only did that. He was only able to do that after his sin with Bathsheba and the forgiveness that God gave him. Paul could lead sinners to Jesus only after he became the chief of all sinners, in 1 Timothy 1, 15. You know, there's probably not a more powerful witness to unbelievers than a sinner saved by grace. Maybe you have something that's causing you some guilt today. You need to claim God's grace where you need it most. We need to do all we can to shine the light of Christ. We need to make sure that we seek to let others know about the only one who can save them. In Mark 8, verse 35, Mark 8, verse 35, this is Jesus talking. He says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's the same shall save it. You know, if you look at the surveys in America, you know, Pew Research, all these different surveys, 
it, they, they confirm that most people believe in heaven and hell. And a lot of these same people think they're going to heaven. Not many people believe they're going to hell. There's a few that say, oh yeah, I'm going to end up in hell. You kidding me? I think there's going to be a lot of people surprised. I mean, Jesus said more people are headed to hell than to heaven. He did. If you look at Matthew 7, um, verse 13, again, this is Jesus talking. He says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Sounds like a lot more people are going to hell than heaven. So, Jesus is saying probably the opposite of what most people think. A lot of people think, oh yeah, I'm going to heaven. I'm a good guy. I've never killed anybody. It takes a little more than that. You have to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. Romans 10 verse 9 says, if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I think... There's a high percentage of people who think they're going to heaven that are tragically mistaken. We need to strive to try to reach not only the sinners, but those who don't know they're not saved. You know, those people who believe in heaven but live like there is no God. We all will stand before God one day, give an account of our lives. Um... We need to be reconciled to God and live for Christ Jesus. Very important. Um, we need to try to live in God's grace, even though we're where we are. In Philippians 1, starting right there in verse 1, Paul and Timotheus, the servant of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you, because I have you in, me, in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record. How greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. You know, most of Paul's letters, actually I think all of Paul's letters, begin with an expression of God's grace to us. You know, I think some people think, oh, well, that was probably just the way they greeted each other back then. I don't think so. I mean, God's grace is our foundation. It's it's our, our covering. It's It's what we have our lives filled with as believers in Christ. Grace is typically described as God's unmerited favor, his undeserved favor, uh, something we don't deserve. You know, Ephesians 2 verse 8 says it's the means by which we're saved through faith. Grace through faith. Romans 5 2 says that our faith, by our faith, we have obtained our introduction into this grace in which we stand. We are recipients of abundant, continual grace throughout life, and I believe into eternity. God's grace never ceases to do its work within us, within our lives. Paul could confidently say, He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Will perfect it. Um, God is the one who keeps his promises to complete us when Christ returns. John says in, in 1 John uh, 3 verse 2 that 
When we see Christ, we're going to see him as he is, and we're going to be just like him. You see, our spirit, when you came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your spirit became just like Christ. It's this flesh that gets in our way. This flesh that causes us to sin. Um, Paul says we've been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ and glorifies God. I know if you're like me, a lot of times it's hard to see the righteousness in ourselves. We know we're weak. We're no, we know we're flawed. We know that we fall short of God's standard of perfection. I've never lived a perfect day in my life. Um, my best day on earth would not gain me access into heaven. It's only through Jesus Christ. You see, there's nothing I can do to earn God's favor. But I can trust in Christ who did everything necessary for me to have everlasting life. Um, if we've been saved, then it's Christ that lives in us and we live in him. John 15 verse 4. He is our righteousness. He's producing this fruit in our lives as we trust in him, as we lean upon him. This process known as sanctification is God's grace working to align our behavior with the righteousness of Christ. So we need to stand firm in his grace and trust him to complete the work that he began in us. Um, in Luke 16, 22 says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. This story very clearly and plainly teaches that there is life after death. You know, there is no soul sleep where our souls are awaiting the resurrection of our bodies, you know, but we go into a conscious eternity instantly. It also shows there's only two destinations possible after dying. We either go to a place of torment for the wicked or we go to a place of blessing for the righteous. There's no limbo. There's no purgatory. There's no middle ground. There's no second chance. It's final. Your eternal destiny is final once you die. The difference between heaven and hell is Jesus Christ. That's the difference. Did you know him? Did you trust him? Did you accept him as Lord and Savior? Abraham's bosom is, is symbolic of a, a, a place of comfort for a righteous person. It was, um, it was symbolizing a place of comfort. Abraham, father of faith. Um, the rich man's body was in the grave, but this passage, passage speaks of him lifting up his eyes and seeing Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. You know, I, I think our soul probably looks very similar to what our bodies look like, so that it is recognizable. Um, and maybe our soul looks exactly like our bodies look. I don't know. A couple of the disciples didn't recognize Jesus' resurrected body, although it says they knew he was the Lord, but they, they didn't recognize him right away. Maybe it was because... Uh, Somehow he seemed a little different. Uh, when Peter, James, and John saw Jesus transfigured uh, on the mountain, they recognized Moses and Elijah, which is kind of strange. I mean, they knew it was them, but obviously they didn't know Moses and Elijah on earth because they lived several hundred years before them. But this man's torment was from the flames, from the fire. But he was also tormented by the thoughts of his loved ones on earth and their eternal destiny, saying, hey, send someone back to tell them so they don't end up where I am. I mean, his helplessness to warn them probably made his pain even worse. What was it Jesus said? Oh, even if someone were to come back from the dead and tell them, it still wouldn't help. And then Christ returned from the dead. <coughs> uh, he could see Lazarus. He could see Abraham in a place of complete comfort and total blessing. 
that probably kept him from ever adjusting to this place of torment and becoming okay with it because he could see something better, something on the horizon that he wished he had. Hell is just a lot more than a place of physical torment. Um, they will be in hell forever, tormented with the thoughts of what could have been if they had only trusted Jesus Christ. They heard the story of Jesus, but they rejected it out of pride, out of ignorance. You know, the greatest witness anyone could ever receive is the witness from God's word. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So we need to make sure we're sharing the word as often as we can. But we have to know the word before we can speak the word. You know, if you hear two or three different speakers these days, it seems there's a lot of opinions out there about what the Bible says, you know, about this particular doctrine. You know, I see so many Christians arguing about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib rapture, and who Mystery Babylon is, and... Uh, so many different interpretations of various signs and uh, different interpretations about the end times. I see a lot of comments on my channel and, and other places that sound like they're kind of biblical, but they're not at all. Um, you know, who's the real Israel? Um, all these different kind of things. You know, Opinions on God's holy word are so diverse, it's no wonder that Christians can't agree on a whole lot. Everyone seems to be so very opinionated and stuck in their way is the only way. And, you know, I go by God's word. And if ever I feel like I'm believing something based on my own opinion, I go back into God's word. Um... You have to remember what Proverbs 16, 18 says before you get to a point to where you think you're all high and mighty and everyone's wrong but you. Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. You know, I've heard all kinds of things. I, I've heard things in the past 10 or 12 years um, that I would have never thought I would hear from people. You know, I've heard people saying, oh, we shouldn't be witnessing to others about the gospel because we're not worthy of doing so. And you know, there was a time in my life when I felt that way. I thought, I can't tell this person about Jesus when I'm living like the devil over here. I thought, I'm not worthy to speak of God's word. And that's, I think that's just another lie from the devil to oppress you, to keep you down, to keep you from spreading the word, to keep you from using your testimony to reach others. Um, I've heard people say, oh, we shouldn't make disciples out of anyone because things are just going to get worse. It's not going to help. Um, you know, some people will question someone's salvation based on whether they believe a certain doctrine or not. Oh, you believe once saved, always saved. You're going to hell. Or, oh, you believe in this particular doctrine. You're going to hell. But I think before people make these kind of statements, people need to understand what's true, not just based on some YouTube preacher or some prophet or teacher or what they read on the internet or something. Find out for yourself. God has given us his word. Holy Bible. I'm surrounded with close to 300 books of his word right here in my office um know the word in context in acts 17 11 it it talks about those those barians uh, the people from berea they were more noble than those in thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those those things were so they were searching the scriptures daily can you honestly say that you do that in in um where was it first first kings 13 or thereabouts there was this young prophet 
who was told by the Lord not to eat or drink water and to not return by the same way that he had gone on this journey. But then an older prophet told the younger one that an angel had spoke to him by the word of the Lord that the young prophet was to come to the old prophet's house and eat and drink with him. So he did. But then a word of the Lord came to that older prophet because the um, because the younger prophet disobeyed what the Lord told him. And that word came to this older prophet saying, this younger guy's going to die. And then when that young prophet left, uh, verse 24 or so in, in 1 Kings 13 tells us that a lion met him, by the way, and slew him. So you have to be careful. You know, if someone's going to claim they know the word of God and what God is telling them, they better know for sure and not allow someone else to sway them. That young prophet should have listened. He should have listened because God told him not to eat or drink and don't return the same way that you came. And then what did he do? He went to that other guy's place and he ate and he drank and he returned the same way he came. He did exactly what he was told not to do because he trusted the words of that older prophet who said, oh, I got a word from the Lord that you should come to my house. You got to watch it. You got to be careful. Test every spirit. Test if it's from God or not. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And didn't we cast out devils? And in thy name done all kinds of wonderful works? Loosely translated. Um, He says, but then I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. See, make sure you know the word of God yourself. Study it. Read it. Prove what others are saying it says. Prove it to yourself. Read it. Get into it. Study it. It's important. Don't accept every doctrine based on what somebody else says it says. Search it for yourself. If someone says, oh yeah, the Bible tells us that God wants us to be rich and have a mansion and, 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 and to have a big fat bank account. Check it. Check it and see. If somebody tells you the Bible says this or that and you're kind of skeptical, ask them, what chapter and verse is that? Give me book, chapter, and verse. Show me where you're getting this. You know, half the time I have somebody tell me something that I know the Bible doesn't say and I ask them that, they'll point me to some, oh, here's, here's a verse, and you read it and you go, how in the world did you glean that from this passage? And it says nothing about what you're saying it says. And other times people say, oh, well, I, I don't remember where I read that, but I remember reading it. Yeah, chances are it wasn't from Scripture. It was from somebody else's blog or passage or book that they wrote. So make sure you know if somebody's telling you something that comes from the Word. Make sure you know whether it truly does come from the Word or not. You know, find out for yourself and be doers of the word, not just hearers only. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.